Good morning. Hi. I didn't know you hit play yet or record. Oh, yeah. I did. We're, we're on. We're on. <clears throat> so this week we talked about, um, this week was Easter Sunday. Is it Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday? Yep. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I do not have a preference in that matter. No. Some we, people do. <clears throat> yeah. Some That's people right. were some people were very quick on Sunday. Like when I said Easter, they were like very quick on the resurrection Sunday. And yeah. <laughs> some people really have that preference. And some people really don't. So mm -hmm. That's all right. Yep. The point is Jesus was in a grave and then he wasn't. Yes. And he still is not. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I was... So this has nothing to do with what I said we were going to talk about. That's all right. <laughs> it happens. I read. I was reading through all... Like, Sunday morning when I woke up, I read through all of the... All of the resurrection accounts of Jesus from the Gospels. And I wonder, like... I, like, I wish there was a camera, because I, I would like to see kind of like the order of events that took place, yeah. like the angel comes and the stone gets rolled away. Like, did Jesus walk out? Was the tomb already empty? Did he flop? Like, I like to think that he flop, flew out, because that's what I would do if I were him. <laughs> did he, like, teleport himself to Galilee, but then, like, he was there so they could follow the right. speed and worship him? Like... <clears throat> Like, what were the event? Like, what happened? Yeah. It's interesting to read through all of those and, and see all of the different pieces of that event and the perspectives of what happened. Um, did you see any of the memes this week about Peter and John running? No. There, there are some good ones about <coughs> John running faster. They're kind right. of using, like, some animated... Some anime runner, mm -hmm. and yeah, they were good. Yeah, I did. I always, I, I have liked John, like just the way John talks about himself <laughs> in his gospel. It's like, but the other disciple, like he ran faster. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> then I also liked how um, when they got to the tomb, like he wouldn't go in because if you go in to where a dead person is, you're right. not clean. So he's like, I'm not oh, going in there. I'm not, you know, he's like holier than thou. Like, I'm not going But remember, there. I got here first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I've seen the personalities <laughs> of the, especially of John's. John's personality come out in his writing. It's just really, yeah, it's really interesting the way he talks about himself. Yeah. It, it would be interesting. Yeah, just to see how how all the disciples talk about themselves and how they talk about each other. Mm -hmm. um, and we see a glimpses of that in the Gospels. But just to be able to sit down with them and and hear them interacting with each other, I think would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And just a huge testament to the way Jesus transformed them. Yeah. Because at year one, I bet he was breaking up fights. I mean, maybe not literally, but maybe. Mm -hmm. Three years down the road, I think we see a, a very different picture of the disciples and just their cohesiveness and the way they had set aside all the things that were important to them before and aligned themselves with the mission of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That made all their differences insignificant, mm -hmm. which is also not what we were going to talk about. But right. You started it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, but I think we see, I mean, I think, I mean, that's the, that's the discipleship process. Yeah. That, I mean, take any, I, I think of, I think of any of the, any of the ministry teams like that we, that we have here. Like you can see a difference between when they first get together or first got together and look at them months or years later, kind of depending on what the structure and the nature of that team was. 
um, you see that cohesiveness yeah um, taking place yeah and it's not that Jesus was making them into a bunch of clones and so yeah. you guys are all exactly the same now so you get along great they all were still unique personalities mm -hmm. and yet they were submitting everything about those personalities to who Jesus is and what Jesus wants mm -hmm. and yeah that was, that's just an interesting picture that we see through throughout the Gospels especially mm -hmm. of those interactions yeah and I, I think we were talking about this yesterday in staff meeting we were talking a little bit about Peter I think like I don't know what last I think it was last week or the week before I've got um, so even though last week I was writing my Easter message, I had I had the next four weeks of kind of series talking about the church on my brain yeah. as well, because that's kind of how I operate. I'm working on like multiple, you know, multiple messages at the same time. So I just, I started reading through um, Acts chapter two and Acts two, Holy Spirit descends. I always do this, tongues of fire on their heads. Um, and everyone thinks they're drunk because they're speaking in all of these different languages. Right. And Peter is the one that that speaks. And it's like if you were to flip back through the Gospels, you would see that it's oh, it's not always, but it's I should often. say often. Yeah. It's often Peter who is like the first one to kind of speak or say something like that we would I would consider silly or dumb or stupid like he's just like the first one to do that and here and now here he is in this moment of holy spirit power fulfilling that fulfilling that same role yeah but he's still the one that's speaking up yeah and they all did but we we seem to hear Peter's voice mm -hmm. first in a lot of those circumstances. Yeah, and that's just like I was just thinking. We and we're going to talk about this probably in a few weeks. But what you were saying, like even though even though Jesus discipled them, he didn't make them all clones. They were still they were still individual personalities. They were still who they were. Right. But at a different level. Yeah, I think God has crafted each of us uniquely, and he uses the way he has crafted us uniquely for the unique work that he has for each of us to do. And when we talk about him transforming our lives, that that means shaving off some parts, that means cutting out some parts, that means reshaping some pieces completely. But he does that with the material that he has already placed within us. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't do that with anything other than his son in mind as a model. Yeah. But I think when we when we talk of Jesus as a person, there's a completeness there that allows for me to be shaped into his image and you to be shaped into the, his image and still be you and me mm -hmm. in his image it's not just mash us up into the the play-doh form and everybody comes out looking identical disciples churches still have unique identities and your gifts and abilities are different than mine and the next guy's and we are all, and, and maybe this leads into some of the upcoming church series, we're different in ways that cause us to need each other. Yeah. And I think that we can see that in the disciples. They needed somebody that was going to speak first. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they needed somebody that was going to run faster at times too. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, so many times... I know I've heard people say, people in the church say, I wish I could sing like this person or play the guitar like that or speak like this or nobody ever says, I wish I could serve in children's ministry like that person. <laughs> they should. 
<laughs> like I don't know that I've ever heard that anyone say that, but that, that you should, and we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. <laughs> um, but I, I think we hear people say those kinds of things all the time. Yeah. I wish I could blank like blank, and the reality of it is, is that's not that's not the design, right? Yeah, I think one of the things that has brought me the greatest joy in ministry is not seeing people become like somebody else that they have been mentored by or are trying to emulate, but by seeing somebody recognize the potential that God has put in them, submit that to him and allow him to bring out the best of who they are um, instead of mimicking the best of who God has made someone else to be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's, it's important to remember that the church needs you. The church needs the best of who I am, not the best of who I can copy. Um, and that's been true for a really long time. And that's hard. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I, yeah, I, I've watched and listened to lots of different people over the years who preach and speak and teach in student ministry and do all those things. And I, I've certainly had those same, like those same thoughts of, and so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sound like I've got that figured out. Um, I can definitely say um, there's less of that now, but it's still something that I like. Right. I wrestle with, um, struggle with, even like even yeah. I, I, that's still something I I trying to maybe trying to find like find my own voice in the midst of that, and I think maybe that's a. I don't know, maybe that's a healthy version of like wishing I could be like someone else but recognizing that I am me. And this is getting close to where we talked about going today. Yes, yeah. Because I think that might be the key. Um, this Sunday you talked about finding rest and the kind of rest that really only Jesus can provide. And I think a, a big part of that is actually acknowledging mm -hmm. who am I in, in this sense that who, who has God created me to be? Not who am I trying to be? Not who's the, the model that I'm trying to copy? But who, who has Jesus created me to be? Yeah. And resting in that and working in that vein and not worrying about, man, I don't preach like Matt Chandler, I'm not as creative as Zero McManus or whoever your favorites are. Um, we don't, and I wanna be careful, like it's one thing to, to learn from a model and it's another thing to elevate an idol. Yeah. And I think there's a fine line like I, there's a lot that I can learn from a lot of speakers. Um, there are things that I'm reading and I'll, I'll hit a certain phrase or idea and it's just like, man, I wish I could write like that. Mm -hmm. So if I begin to do some work to craft those skills in me that will allow me to write more like that, that's a good thing. Right. If I begin to, you know, fixate on this particular writer, and you know, they eat corn pops for breakfast, so I'm going to start eating corn pops for breakfast. <coughs> we can get really ridiculous, really fast, right, right, in those things, and and just idolizing and trying to even sometimes emulate the wrong things mm -hmm. about great people. Um, and when we do that, we miss the gift that God wants to make of us to his church. Um, it's in Ephesians, it talks about God gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as teachers and evangelists and 
shepherds. He gave all of those to the church in order to equip all of the church for all of the work that God has for all of the church to do. Mm -hmm. And every single one of us has a place in that. God wants to make a gift out of your life to the church for the work of the church. And that won't happen if we get so fretfully busy trying to be like somebody else that we think is more of a gift to yeah. the church. Yeah. And I think that's a place where we find some rest. Yeah. Yeah, and that and this is yeah, this we just jumped into what we had talked about, what we had talked about talking about today. Like the rest that we talked about on Sunday was was a, like we kind of a weariness of life rest. Mm -hmm. But but this is a that's one of the things like sidebar. That's one of the things I like about I love about the Bible, and I love about the way Jesus taught is there's like fifty million layers to what he's to to what he's teaching on. And I think I think that's exactly it because we can become we can become wearied and heavy burdened by trying to emulate and be like someone else. Yeah. And that rest is no, you don't have to you don't have to be like that person. I'm like you can find that rest in me. So your rest is not gonna come in being like this person or playing an instrument like that person or parenting like like looking um you know, I see I see Bridget Bruns is on here. I don't know if she still is, but Bridget Bruns is on here. Um, man, there is I think there's so much pressure on parents right now to make sure that you're parenting a certain way. Like, scroll, uh, we talk about social media. We haven't actually for a couple weeks, so it's a new record for me. <laughs> um, but we talk about like social media. I mean, scroll through Instagram, and if you're if you're a new mom. Like there is, there's an industry around parenting. Yeah. Like look at, look at, look at how, mom, you can do this. All you have to do is spend three hours a day doing this, cooking that, making your house look like this. Like I just, I could not imagine entering into that. Like, and I say that because I have my own spaces where I, where I do that. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, how how do you? Yeah, I mean that would be really wearisome and and carrying of, of heavy burdens, I think, for parents. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of areas of life today where information is everywhere, <clears throat> and we are consuming and repackaging and producing more information today than like the rate of that is crazy. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, we can very easily succumb to the weariness that comes from just having this flood of information coming at us all the time. Whether that's a news channel telling us what to be freaked out about or a mommy blog telling us, here's all your inadequacies. And I know that's not what they intend, but it's very easy for us to take those things that way. Right. You know. Here's the the art of being a man and oh, I don't really do that or that or that and just to begin to decrease our our picture of who we are mm -hmm. and into that Melee Jesus says take my yoke upon yeah. you mm -hmm. and learn from me Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light and I think we need to be careful how we how we process that. Um, I'm not sure Jesus, when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, like he didn't mean this is gonna be a breeze. There's really only one reason for a yoke and that's to do some work. You, you hitch yourself together with Jesus in this case and you go to work. Whatever that work is that he has intended you to do, he has perfectly crafted his yoke so that as you join with him in that work you're getting it done and you're able to rest in the knowledge that 
really he's getting it done. Mm-hmm. It, it's not an it's not an equal yoke. Yeah. Like if you and I hitched each other <clears throat> to like some wagon we're gonna pull, we could probably pull at a fairly similar rate. Mm-hmm. Um, if me and Jesus are pulling, he's got a whole lot more strength than I do for whatever the task is. Right. And so whatever he's asking me to do, I want to hitch myself to him and then really just follow along. It's not that I'm doing nothing. I'm taking the next steps that he's asking me to take. I'm pulling in the direction that he's asking me to pull. But in the bigger picture, it's really him that's that's pulling all the way. Yeah, um it's, so I had in my notes, it's funny, like it was like talking about this concept of a yoke. I had in my notes on Sunday that I think I talked about this, but honestly, like every Sunday for me, <laughs> like when I'm done, it just seems like, um, what did I just, yeah, say? What did I just say? It <laughs> honestly feels like so many times like that space was just a complete blur to me. I have no idea what I said. Well, one of the things that was in my notes, so I may or may not have said this. So if I did, you're going to get it again. Um, <laughs> But like a farmer would frequently yoke a younger, inexperienced animal with an older, more experienced animal to kind of learn, like learn what it was supposed to yeah. do. And that's that's exactly the that, that's exactly what you were just talking about. Is Jesus is when we are yoked to Jesus, He is the one that's that's doing the work and is, and is showing us what it like how to do it perfectly. Like this is what, this is what it looks like for you to be yoked with me. Is I'm going to demonstrate for you how how to do this certain task. And then I also think then considering discipleship, it probably should go the same way. So then we yoke ourselves with people who can show us, but we also yoke with people who we are the yeah. older, more experienced animal. In keeping with that metaphor, so we're the one who's showing them how to do that thing. Yeah. I when you said Jesus is yoke, I instantly thought like Instagram's yoke is pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, like, because there's always somebody smarter or prettier or better at making money out of nothing. Um, yeah, Instagram is designed to feed our sense of deficiency and cause us to seek out affirmation in places where it's never really gonna come. Yeah. So do you ever get, so do you ever get anxious? No, not at all. Yeah, um, that That's a lie. <coughs> I was just thinking how I kind of just rag on Instagram and I don't, I don't care about Instagram, but, um, I just post Bible verses on there from our church account. Like that's my, yeah, I've kind of gone through some spurts. Like I just deleted it for a while. Mm. Um, cause there's just a lot of garbage on there that I really didn't want to deal with and don't need to deal with. Uh, and so I just didn't do anything for a while. And then we started doing the core 52, um, book with our students last year and so each week there's a verse of the week and I would post kind of a a verse image from that and I think I've posted like two things Mm -hmm. since we finished that Um, I think one was like a picture of food and Mm -hmm. like one was a bonsai tree or something that I was working on so not really heavy into Instagram but you know there really is a lot there that is designed to feed that anxiety, uh, the anxieties that we have and cause us to seek out, like how am I gonna fix this or find mm-hmm. this or who's doing this better that I could copy. Um, and yeah, I get. I would say that um, like probably six or seven years ago I had somebody tell me you are the most non-anxious person I've ever known like you just never are stressed Um, I would say that's probably I don't know if they'd still say that today Um, but 
throughout my life, I've tended to not be a very, at least visibly stressed and anxious person, um, which has kind of driven some people crazy. Like sometimes people want to see, like I want to see you stressed or worried about something so that I know that you're still alive and paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And it's not that I've never been paying attention to what's going on in the world or all the things that we have to worry about, those those things still come at me. Uh, I find that these days my greatest anxieties or stresses really have to do with my kids mm-hmm. and and where they're at in life. Uh, I was I was talking with Luann the other day. Luann's my wife. For those of you that don't know, just for a little context. Also, I'm Mike. I'm one of the pastors here, and this yeah. is John, one of the I, other pastors here. I don't think we even set that <clears throat> stage today. We did not. That's all right. But anyway, now you know. So I was talking to my wife the other day, and right after we graduated college, we needed to find a place to live, and we had to move out of the dorm or out of the the college apartments. Um, so we decided to move close to where we wanted to be, and not really having a church that was coming open where we wanted it, and um, so we, we actually took a big map and we threw a dart and we moved to that, that spot. It was just us. We had no responsibilities, no, like we figured we'll get there. We'll find jobs. We're fairly intelligent, creative, hardworking people. How hard could it be? We'll figure it out. God will take care of us. And we did that and it was great. The thought of doing that now seems like today with I have four kids. Three of them are still at home. Mm -hmm. One graduates and starts college next year. One graduates and starts college the year after that. Um, One is off in Omaha on her own already. But even with them being out of the house and only the thought of one or two still being at home, it was like, we would never do that to our kids. (laughs) That just seems stupid. But back then it was like, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. So I, I, that, that's my source of stress and anxiety. And I will, I will say like confessionally, it is more difficult for me to trust God with my kids' future Mm -hmm. than probably anything else that I've experienced in my life. Like I want... I want to to set the stage and help them take every step and you know we we raise them we teach them to talk and walk and like how to interact with people Um, we want to see them flourishing in life and there are things that we feel like I can do this to help that happen but ultimately we have to remember our kids make their own choices our kids will make their own mistakes and they will have to live with the consequences of those mistakes. Now, we want to do everything we can to prepare them for the choices that they have, but the bottom line is they're going to make their own decisions. And it's hard for me to, like, I can put my own self in God's hand and say, just do whatever you want. I can handle whatever garbage because I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna lean on you. It's really a lot harder for me to acknowledge the fact that my kids are his and he's working in their life just like he's working in mine. He's taking care of them, he's guiding them just like he's guiding me. And so that's that's where my anxiety sure. and stress has and it's not their fault. I don't want them to watch this and feel guilty. They're not watching this. But that's where, like we were talking earlier, like at what point is my anxiety level an indicator of a, a deficiency of trust? Yeah. And for me, that's been, over the last several years, I've noticed more, like that's where 
that's where I can see the less I trust God with this, the more I am getting ratcheted up in anxiety about it. And again, that's where we get back to take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and essentially it's do what you can do and trust that I'm doing what I can do. Mm -hmm. And what I can do, Jesus shows us, is whatever needs to happen. Like he's, he's got it. And our role is to do our work and trust him to do his. Mm -hmm. And I find that when my life is at stake, that's a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think for me, like, I, I mean, I deal with anxieties of all kinds of in all kinds of different ways as well. Um, and we talked about this yesterday. A, a primary anxiety of me is just, just the whole Sunday morning thing. Like, what, what are we going to talk about? What am I going to say? Um, and that. I mean, that sounds, I don't know, I don't want that to sound trite or anything like that. But man, like I, I'm, especially when we go into a topic that we're going to be talking about, about the church over the next several weeks, not that everything we talk about is, isn't <laughs> important. Like, I mean, it's just God's word. So what could be, why would I be anxious about that? Um, and I had somebody, you know, are you, someone asked me, um, are you concerned how people are going to respond? And I, that's not, that's not it so much as it is like, am I, am I going to, am I going to say what, what I feel like God wants me to say? Or am I going to kind of trip over <laughs> into this, into this little area where, okay, that was, a, that was a lot more John than God. Okay. And like that for me, that, that creates, that creates a lot of anxiety, especially on an issue like the church, where I have some pretty strong feelings about, and um, some pretty big concerns about as I think about as I think about the church, and not just not just Westway, but just the church as a as an entity, as the body. Like I just have some really big concerns about that, and I feel myself the slightest bit of um, someone doesn't have to put a lot of pressure on me in talking about the church for my like <laughs> internally for my tachometer to go from a thousand to red line <laughs> like it just it doesn't take much in that conversation yeah. and I think you know how to entering into God's rest in that moment like he, so here you go. Like these will just be some Jesus answers. Jesus loves the church more than me. So that will be, so just talking through this right now, like that'll be a really good thing for me to remember over the yeah. next four weeks. That Jesus loves the church more than I do. Yeah. I think also the, like entering into his rest, it doesn't just mean. I'm sitting here doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like you still have messages to prepare. You still have like thoughts to collect and just put them in order. And <clears throat> this is what I'm going to say. And this is how I'm going to say it. We still have all of that that we have to do. Mm -hmm. But we can do that restfully. And I think Jesus really... Kind of a good example, I think. I don't remember if it was right before or right after. Um, it was really close to the same episode where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Where he heals somebody on the Sabbath. When, when we're supposed to rest, according to the Pharisees. And like, they were very offended that Jesus did that work on Sabbath. The Sabbath on the day of rest how dare you violate rest 
And, and it was almost a forced value. And, and Jesus really kind of flipped that value on its head. Um, because rest isn't necessarily an absence of work to do. Yeah. I think often the best rest is in the midst of and in the aftermath of the work being done. Like, like if my child falls in a well, do you think, well, it's nap time, I'm resting, I'll take care of that later. No, right. you go and take care of that. How can I rest when, when my kid is in danger? And I think as we, as we apply that to the church and as we're kind of defining what is the church all about in these next several weeks, we want to do that with this rest mm. in mind. Mm. We don't want to heap up a bunch of burdens on each other about this is what we have to do in church and this is all of the the things that are expected and demanded and I mean we have a lot of opportunities for people to serve here but we want those to be undertaken from a standpoint of I think maybe God can use me in this can I try this Maybe that's, I don't know if I'm great with third graders, but I think maybe God can use me in the third grade class. He can, okay? There's just a <laughs> yeah. just quick discipline. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> um, sometimes it's a process of trying something and moving on because, well, that's not quite it, but let's try the next thing. But what we don't want it to be is this huge guilt trip where well somebody has to do it so I guess it'll be me. And I think sometimes we we in the church can take that mentality and we've we've seen great examples of of servanthood and a willingness to do the job that isn't getting done but I think also we need to be really careful like this isn't about here's where you're falling short church and you have to do these things and these things and these things right. to be a good church um, I hope that's not where you're going okay. no no not going there because when we actually enter into the work that God has for us to do, we also find the rest that God has for us. And we can't find that anywhere else. Yeah, so I I think of applying that to myself over the next four weeks. Like, just being comfortable with the things that I'm going to say. Because, like, this is the way that God has wired me. And this is what he's equipped me for. And trusting in him and trusting in his rest and not like one of the things that's been and we need to go. <laughs> this is getting long. It's been long. It's getting long. Even one of the things we're going to talk about this week is in is in First Corinthians one to three. Paul says a few times, um, you know, I did basically I didn't come at you with lofty arguments, but just with the gospel. Like in just being and so again, maybe just a pressure reliever for me. Like, can it be enough for just let Scripture speak for itself? Like, I don't have to add any more to it. <laughs> like, we can just be comfortable that the Scripture is sufficient. Yeah. And I think that is finding rest and like just being if if Scripture and I say if if Scripture is God breathed, whatever that means. <laughs> um, like. We're going to be okay with it. Yeah. Um, but I, I like I like the idea, too, of just that identity in Christ, knowing who we are, and being comfortable with that. Um, <laughs> so, 
So bring your anxiety of yourself to Christ <laughs> and be okay with what he does. Is how I would yeah. sort of summarize, like just rest in that he knows what he's doing. And I don't know. So this week, we are starting to talk about the church. Four weeks. This is part of our How the Bible Works series, um, because we've gone through all of the Old Testament. We've had two weeks of messages on um, the Messiah, talking about Jesus. Um, And then we're going to spend four weeks talking about the church. And this week we're talking about Christ as the head of the church and what does that mean? What does it look like practically? Like when we say that, we say, well, Jesus is running the show here. Like that's a really great Sunday school answer. <laughs> um, it's true, but what does that mean? Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like for, um, for church leaders to equip and empower people within, within the body. And... Just what does it really mean for us to know that Christ is in charge, and how do we, like, how do we respond and act because of that, and what does that mean for us? So, if you're here in the area, we'd love for you to join us at ten fifteen on Sunday morning. You can also join us online, um, live, just live stream at ten fifteen. Um, so we just want to encourage you to uh, to do that. So thanks for watching today. Um, anything you want to add? Closing thoughts? Um, No, I guess I would say one thing in addition to the live stream that we do, we've started this week um, posting a weekly bit of um, content from our children's ministry. Essentially, it's the stuff that we use on Sunday morning for children's ministry. Uh, We're making that available for you at home to use. Uh, it's called Playlister. You can find it on our Family Ministries page. Just click the link where it says Playlister. Um, about two-thirds of the way down into the page where it says Resources. And I would love to hear a little bit of feedback on how that works for you. Uh, it's a new thing, and so we're kind of tweaking it. Uh, one thing that I noticed already is everything is all stuck together, and I think we need to divide out the age groups and create a few different lists. Uh, But if you would check that out and let me know what you think, let me know what your kids think. Uh, It's for the younger kids, so like elementary and preschool age. Uh, But I would love some feedback on that. So you can let me know either. You just email me. It's Mike at Mm -hmm. WestwayChurch.com. I would really appreciate that. That would be really helpful for our ministry team with the kids. Awesome. Well, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on Sunday morning and um, look forward to connecting with you. So have a great rest of your week. See ya.